my name is Leanne and today I'm going to be telling you about all of the books that I read in September. September was a bit of a weird month and reading month for me. As I've mentioned several times, I've started a new job, which takes up a large chunk of what would have previously been my reading time. So in the middle of the month I had not a reading slump, but it was just taking me a really long time to read books. There were like several days where I just wasn't reading at all. But I was reading really well at the start of the month and I managed to compensate at the end of the month as well. It does feel like such a long time ago since I've read some of these books because it's just felt like it's been such a long month. But yeah, I read, I think it was 11 books. A lot of them were quite short, but that's okay. Anyways, I'm just gonna crack on and tell you about all of the books I read in September. The first book I read in September was Brown Girl Dreaming by Jacqueline Woodson. This is a memoir told in verse about Jacqueline growing up as an African-American girl in the 1960s and 70s. I'm really intrigued by the use of verse in literature that is aimed at young adults. I've seen it done really, really well in some cases, and in some cases I've seen it as actually holding back the story that an author was trying to tell. But this book definitely falls into the former category. The use of the verse form did nothing but enhance the storytelling. It really contributed to how well Jacqueline was able to tell us the story of her life. There's a lot in here with regards to the author's relationship with her family, the different relationships she has with all of her different relatives, the relationship she has with herself as well, and the intersections of race into all of those things. There were a couple of sections that particularly stood out to me which I tabbed. There's one very short one called Ghosts. In downtown Greenville they painted over the white only signs. Except on the bathroom doors they didn't use a lot of paint. So you can still see the words right there, like a ghost standing in front, still keeping you out. I think that's just a fantastic example of showing, not telling. And the last stanza of Stevie and me says some really powerful things about representation. If someone had taken that book out of my hands, said, you're too old for this, Maybe I'd never have believed that someone who looked like me could be in the pages of the book, that someone who looked like me had a story. A little bit meta as well, because I'm sure that this book will have that same effect on a number of different readers. So yeah, I really enjoyed this one, I would highly recommend it. And it's beautifully designed as well, which definitely helps. I'm gonna stick with that kind of target age for the books I'm gonna talk about next. We will get to the more grown-up stuff in a minute. <laughs> but the next two books that I read were massive comfort reads for me. I read Picture Perfect and All That Glitters by Holly Smale and these are the third and the fourth books in the Geek Girl series. I really love the Geek Girl series. If you've not heard about it before, it is about a young girl named Harriet Manners. She's stereotypically geeky, she's quite socially awkward, she has a lot of random facts, she's very aware of her own intelligence, naive in many ways, she's definitely a flawed character and she goes through a lot of character progression throughout the series. Harriet is picked up by a modelling agency in the first novel and each subsequent novel just follows her on the next step of her journey both in terms of her career but also her personal life. We follow the relationships with her parents and with her friends. In the third book we see her and her family move to New York. Her father has a new job there. So we follow all of the characters adapting to that. I also found the depiction of Harriet's stepmother, Annabelle, really interesting in this book. Annabelle is an incredibly intelligent, articulate, driven woman. And she has recently had a new baby. They've moved to New York for her husband's job. And we see that new lifestyle not really working for Annabelle. In this book, we're also looking at Harriet's relationship with her boyfriend, Nick, and how there is a huge amount of strain on that relationship. In the fourth book, All That Glitters, we are more focused on Harriet's relationships with her friends, Nat and Toby. Nat has gone to a different school than Harriet. Toby seems preoccupied with this super secret project. So Harriet is trying to work out how to make new friends. There was was something really tacky that Holly Smale could have done with this book and she kind of references the fact that she could have done it and I'm so glad she didn't. I really enjoy these books as I said they're just massive comfort reads for me. I find Harriet a really enjoyable narrator to spend time with and I'm thinking I might finish this series by the end of the year. The next book I'm going to talk about has a child narrator but it is not a book aimed at children and that is The Land of Decoration by Grace McLean. 
So this is about a young girl who has a very religious upbringing. It's very strict, her father is very heavily involved in the church. There's definitely something very uneasy about her religious upbringing. Judith also creates a land of decoration as lends itself to the title. This is sort of a crafted model town that she makes in her bedroom out of various bits and bobs and pieces of rubbish. And Judith comes to believe that whatever she makes happen in her land of decoration happens in real life and she is working miracles. The religious group which she and her father are members of are definitely a fringe Christian group. They are obsessed with like the purge, whatever you want to call it. And when Judith begins to think that she can work miracles, she starts to hear a voice, a voice that she believes belongs to God. I wasn't sure if this was a fantastical element of this story or if it was a depiction of mental illness. That isn't really made clear in the book and I'm not sure if it's supposed to be up to the reader to decipher and decide which one they think it is. I thought the characters in this book were really interesting and complex and flawed. Even the characters that are quite antagonistic are crafted complexly and believably. I think sometimes the author got really wrapped up in how beautifully she can write and kind of forgot her plot line a little bit. There wasn't a particularly exciting or interesting or page-turning plot in this, but I think the idea of it is really fantastic. If you are interested in strange situations, if you are interested in books that take a critical and intriguing look at religion, if you are interested in child narrators, then I would recommend this book but it was probably only like a three star read for me, which is still pretty good. And by the way, this was published by Chato and Windus. The next book I'm gonna to talk to you about is this tiny little picture book published by one of my favorite publishers, Hotkey Books. It's called Night Shift by Debbie Gliori. As I said, this is a tiny little picture book and I would really like to get into reading more picture books. So if you have any recommendations for them, do leave them down below. It only took me a couple of minutes to read, but this is a really fantastic story about fighting depression. I think everything is positioned so well on the page, like the juxtaposition of the illustrations and the words. In this book, a dragon is used as a representation of depression and there is only one moment where colour is used in the book. There's a lot of hope at the end of this book as well. Yeah, I just really love the detailing and the illustrations and the words were just really touching related and empathized with them at a lot of points. This one's definitely worth reading if you have ever struggled with depression and even if you haven't it's it's worth picking up. Next up I have Not Working by Lisa Owens which is published by Picador. I quite enjoyed this book. I thought I was going to end up relating to this book quite a lot because when I was reading it it was just when I had finished job hunting and was starting my new job which is a lot to do with the plot of this book. It follows a protagonist who has quit a job that she's really bored with and is trying to find her passion and applying for jobs. She's kind of stuck in the house while her boyfriend goes to work, which is something that I was kind of going through at that time. But as I read this, I realized that I really wasn't that similar to the protagonist. I think she's a little bit older than me and is a, in a different point of her life than I was. The protagonist in this book doesn't really know what she wants to do with her life, whereas I'm very like set on what I want to do and I like, have a very firm idea of how I'm gonna get there. So the ways I related to her were very surface level. I think this book was really good though. It was a light and easy read and the characters were really interesting. They were complex, they were flawed, they were likable. They were likable at certain points and unlikable at other points because they were realistic characters. At points we see her relationship with her boyfriend being really strong, really lovely to watch, but we also see the difficulties in that relationship. We see moments where they are very unfair to each other and I think seeing that complexity of a long-term relationship represented in a novel was really fantastic. We also follow the protagonist's relationships with her parents. In this book her relationship with her mother is very strained because of something she said about her grandfather and for a lot of the book we are following these characters trying to make up 
There was one point in this book that made me a little bit teary um, because she has a really great relationship with her father and father-daughter relationships just make me a little bit weepy. Um, my dad passed away when I was 18 so whenever there are touching moments between father and daughter I just sob. I think that's one of the reasons I really enjoy the Geek Girl series as well. Harriet has a really great relationship with her father. So yeah, I didn't adore this novel. It's not something that is going to leave me thinking for a while but I enjoyed the process of reading it nonetheless. The next book I'm going to talk about is the only poetry book that I read in September and that is Bone by Ursa Daly Ward. I thought this was a really strong collection and I was actually really surprised by it. Bone is a really visceral collection of poetry and it deals with a number of different topics, detailing the experiences of growing up first generation black British, particularly that from the perspective of a woman. It deals with vulnerability, depression and loss, religion, desire and balancing society's expectations of women with the reality of being a woman. A depiction of abuse in this poetry collection. I think that was done really well. I think this was a collection that managed to be incredibly raw and truthful, a representation of the self and one's emotions without being tacky, as a lot of collections like this so often are. I was really impressed with this one. At the end of the month I picked up some non-fiction. I have committed myself to reading at least one non-fiction book a month and I just didn't get that done in September and realised in the last couple days. So I decided to pick up the shortest non-fiction book on my TBR and that is Dear Ijewala or A Feminist Manifesto in 15 Suggestions by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. So this book came from a friend requesting assistance from Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie on how to raise her daughter in a feminist way. Going into this book, I assumed that it was a letter written to the child. It's not, it's written to the mother, so it was slightly different to what I was expecting. But it is kind of like 15 suggestions or lessons about what it's like to be a woman and particularly a woman of colour. I think Chimamanda said some really important and intelligent things in this and I would expect no less. There was nothing in this that really challenged how I thought about things, which is totally fine. I think it's something that I may come back to if I ever have children one day. The idea of how to raise a child in a feminist way is really interesting to me because I think if I have my own children there are certain attitudes and beliefs and, and all that kind of stuff that I would want to teach them. But at the same time, you don't want to like sit your child down and like explain words like patriarchy and misogyny. <laughs> and when I look back on my own childhood, I don't think I was raised in a sort of explicitly feminist way, but there were a lot of things that my parents did do or didn't do that instilled a real confidence in me as a young woman. Yeah, it's just interesting to get different perspectives on how you can raise a child. And I really enjoyed reading this short little book. One of the other books that I picked up from the library this month was A Streetcar Named Desire by Tennessee Williams. This is the first play that I've read all year. I really love plays, so I don't know why it's taken me until this late in the year to pick one up. I've realised a genre that I actually I'm quite into is like 20th century American literature and specifically plays as well. So this is a play that is set in the southern states of America I believe. It is about a woman named Blanche who shows up at her sister's house and has to stay with her and her husband. There were so many interesting things going on in this play. We have so much to do with the power relations and the inequality between men and women. Stanley, the husband character, is incredibly abusive, but it's almost just kind of expected and accepted. Blanche, who I would say is the main character of this play, has a very fragile sense of her own identity and we see her mental health decline throughout the play. She is sexually assaulted at the end of the play and there are moments where it seems like it's suggested that because of her flaws and because of the immoral actions that she has done in the past, she somehow deserves it. But I think that was through the lens of the horrible characters in this play, rather than any suggestion from the playwright that that is the case. I have a lot of thoughts on this one and I haven't quite gathered them yet. This was one of those books that 
gives me this really great feeling of like, I want to study this, I want to write an essay on this, I want to learn more about it. But if you have read this and you have any thoughts on it, do let me know down below what they are. I read The Glorious Heresies by Lisa McInerney, which is published by Hodder and Stoughton. This is a book set in post-crash Cork, which is a county in Ireland. It follows five misfits who are all kind of forced into situations that they don't want to be in in order to survive. We have Ryan, who is a 15-year-old drug dealer, who is also dealing with the alcoholism of his father. He has an obsession with his unhinged next door neighbour. We have Georgie who is a prostitute. We have Maureen who at the start of the book is an accidental murderer who discovers that her son Jimmy, who she was forced to give away years ago, has become a notorious gangster in the city. All these characters lives are intertwined and with such a broad range of characters, I was really impressed with how distinct they all were, how they each had their own really strong individual voices, how despite the stories being intertwined, it wasn't a problem getting them mixed up in any way. It has so much to do with attitudes towards sex and family in Ireland, which are two things that I'm massively interested in. I think this book was written fantastically. It showed a side to Ireland which I think is so often glossed over or forgotten and the narrative voices in this book were spot on. The next book I read was also the first book in a series and that is The Bear and the Nightingale by Catherine Arden and this book has received a huge amount of praise and I can definitely understand why. This is a really fantastical story that has elements of Russian fairy tales incorporated and it is kind of a chosen one narrative but it doesn't fall into a lot of the tropes that we so often see in chosen one narratives. We have a young female protagonist who is fighting against the people who want to groom her into being the perfect wife. This is a very feminist story as well without being kind of explicit about it and it was really great to see a strong female character that again wasn't tropey in the slightest. This book was also fantastically written, it was incredibly atmospheric and I can really appreciate it for that. I understand why so many people love it. This book has the kind of plot line that doesn't necessarily impact on me in particular, but I could really appreciate it for what it was. When I was reading the first maybe like three quarters of it, I wasn't aware that it was going to be part of a series, so I thought it was paced really oddly. Looking back on it, it definitely read like the first book of a series, so the author's done really well there. And yeah, I can really understand why so many people love it, and I would really recommend it if fantastical fairy tale folklore stories are your kind of thing. So yeah, they are all the books that I read in September, a bit of an interesting mixed reading month for me. Let me know if you have any thoughts on these books down below. How was your reading in September? Was there a book that particularly stood out for you as a favourite? Let me know down below and I will talk to you guys in my next video.